In the interwar period, and indeed during World War II itself, numerous attempts were made at designing an aircraft that could attack a formation of bombers from below. Of these attempts, the Vickers Type 161, also known as the Cow Gunfighter, was perhaps one of the weirdest. In the late 1920s, members of the British Air Ministry were divided on the topic of bomber formations, specifically how to attack them. One group was of the firm belief that large formations of bombers would always need escort fighters. The other believed that bomber defences were becoming sufficient enough that large, organised formations could provide enough defensive fire between them. Understandably, the Air Ministry assumed that the same kinds of arguments were likely happening across the Channel in France and Germany. This in turn meant that they had to plan for the possibility of engaging large, unescorted formations of bombers in a hypothetical war in the future. As these hypothetical bomber formations would be unescorted, they could afford to develop an interceptor with a focus on outright firepower rather than manoeuvrability. This resulted in the issuing of specification F-29-27, which called for an interceptor capable of carrying the 37mm Coventry Ordnance Works Cannon, often known simply as the Cow Gun. Along with being able to carry said gun, the aircraft also needed to be able to rapidly overtake an enemy aircraft, flying at 150 miles an hour at 20,000 feet in the shortest possible time, and maintain enough stability to serve as a stable gun platform. This stability was especially important as the gun would be in a fixed firing position, firing up at an elevation of at least 45 degrees. To reduce complexity, reloading would not be necessary as the gun would be fed by a loading system that held 50 shells. Tenders for this specification were issued to several aircraft manufacturers, one of them being Vickers. Their design, dubbed the Type 161, was one of the most unorthodox and was a callback to the early single-seat pusher fighters of the First World War. Though that might make their design sound archaic, it was, in many ways, ahead of its time. Broadly speaking, this sort of design would feel a lot more at home during the jet era, discounting the fact that it was a biplane. What Vickers had designed was a plane that had a nose-mounted cannon, a pilot positioned far forward, a central engine within the confines of the fuselage, more or less, and one that provided its thrust in a pusher configuration. Its uniqueness certainly caught the attention of the Air Ministry, who eventually rejected four of the seven proposals they received. They took great interest in the structural design of Vickers' new plane, which, amongst other innovations, included concealed control wires that were carried inside the tubular tail booms for added protection. As a result, a contract for the production of a prototype model was granted, and it was completed at the end of 1930. It was built as an unequal span biplane. The wings were arranged with a heavy stagger, had a tubular support structure, and were clad in duraluminium. Support with the fuselage was provided by single tube K struts in a two bay arrangement, and the wings themselves were connected by two pairs of I struts. To produce the high amount of climb required, they were built with a high aspect ratio, and to prevent this causing interference between the upper and the lower wings, the gap between them was kept as wide as possible. As the upper wing also had to be kept relatively low on account of the cannon, the Type 161's wing configuration looked especially weird upon its completion. The central fuselage behind the engine was not really a fuselage. It was in fact a large fuselage-like fairing, with the actual tail support being provided by the twin tail booms. To improve aerodynamics and streamlining, the propellers were mounted in a spinner fairing that matched the slope of the profile of the fairing that connected to the tail. This would prove to be a good move, as eventual tests with the National Physical Laboratory showed that it added a few extra miles an hour to the plane's top speed. The pilot and cow gun were housed in a metal monocoque nacelle. This had a smooth outer skin with a corrugated inner skin riveted directly to it. This was done to withstand the severe shocks expected from the big gun, which, for the time, was certainly on the larger side of things in terms of armament for this sort of aircraft. The combat strategy for using said gun was to fly up and under a formation of bombers, 
hope that they don't notice the interceptor and scatter, and then unload high explosive shells into their weak undersides. An optimistic strategy perhaps, but one that was being pursued nonetheless. In January 1931, the aircraft flew for the first time. On the whole, it went well, but some modifications were made to improve its elevator and yaw stability. Around this time, it was fitted also with elevator trim tabs that could be adjusted in flight, which would mark one of the first appearances of such a device. Further flight trials resulted in other modifications, which included a broader cord rudder, a new tail skid shoe, alterations to the geometry and gearing of the trim tabs, and the addition of small fins near the extremities of the tailplane. Eventually, the aircraft was sent to Martlesham Heath for evaluation trials in September. Apart from a couple of incidents, such as a loose propeller fairing and broken wires in the tail boom caused by loose stones thrown up by the propeller, the trials were without incident, and Vickers aircraft was reviewed favourably by its pilots. The gun was fired in armament trials, without much noticeable effect on the airframe and flying performance. However, the gunnery trials did reveal that the overall workload on the single crew member was a bit… well, it was a bit much. The gun-plane combination was sighted to its target using a periscope sight. This sight was mounted on the left side of the control panel. The gun itself kept the pilot company on the starboard side of the cockpit, complete with its huge, automatically fed ammunition clips, which were stored in racks. This meant that not only did the pilot have to navigate the plane underneath a formation of bombers, all the while hoping that they don't take notice, but he would then have to keep it steady whilst simultaneously having his right eardrum blown out by a bovine-themed cannon, attempting the aerial equivalent of a raking fire. This migraine-inducing complexity was probably the main reason why further development of the Type 161 was stopped. However, the concept of an interceptor mounting upward-firing guns would live on, though the cow gun would never be implemented in such a configuration. With hindsight, and considering the later development of proximity fuses, it can be argued that night fighters with that sort of armament could have delivered some heavy blows during the Battle of Britain, but that will always remain a speculative what-if. Despite its failure, the short-lived development of the Type 161 would set the Air Ministry down the path towards another weird but more iconic interceptor, the Bolton Paul Defiant. But that isn't actually a story for another day, as I've already covered it. However, stay tuned for more weird and wonderful planes in the future. As always, thank you all very much for watching, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.